Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matt Brock, Communications Director here at NCQA. We want to welcome you to this special hangout for the HEDIS 2018 updates and Health Plan Accreditation Standards preview. We're really excited about this because we have a great panel with the details on these updates and changes. They are, to my left, Dr. Mary Barton. She is the Vice President of Performance Measurement here at NCQA. Lisa Slattery, the Vice President of Accreditation and Recognition Operations. And to her left, and I told her I wouldn't mess it up, but I'm not going to, Raina Akindeko. And she's the Assistant Vice President for Product Development. So again, welcome, we're glad you're here. So let's tell you what we have planned for the hour. We're going to start with Dr. Barton to discuss each of the HEDIS updates with some of the technical details and the intent of each change. Then we'll talk to Lisa Slattery about the changes and what we like to call continuous improvement here at NCQA, the background behind them, and uh, what this year with more changes than average means for the future. We know this makes for some administrative challenges. And then finally, we'll talk to Regna. She's got a sneak peek at what to expect for accreditation standards updates later this month. Now, you, the viewer, have a role in all of this too. We will be taking questions via the Hangout chat box to the right of your screen, or you can email them to socialmedia at ncqa.org. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can in this very short hour. We know all of this impacts your work. We know, or we thought it might be helpful if we just presented this information in person, in addition to the resources you'll find in the details section of this Hangout, just below me on your screen. So let's get started, and we're going to start with uh, Dr. Mary Barton, and she's going to run through uh, the measures for us, and we're not going to do a traditional um, presentation as we have in the past, a little experiment. We're just going to discuss them. And we'll start with the new measures. And uh, if we can get uh, the first one up on screen, it is the transitions of care. Now, Dr. Barton, one thing that we've done in communications for this is we've tried to tell everybody differently than in past years. We've given them the details like this, but we've tried to put an in intent statement mm -hmm. so that folks understand why we're doing these. Uh, I want to talk about that, but let's first run through, and you can see up there the uh, the, the slide, and here I'll put it in front of you as well mm -hmm. if you need to refer to it, but the transitions of care. Tell us about this, this uh, new measure. So this is a, a brand new measure that is looking at the vulnerable time when uh, patients are discharged from the hospital, um, how well the communication goes across the sites of care. And so, we're, you know, we're really concerned about the medical errors that can happen when someone is discharged from the hospital. They may have had medications that were changed when they were in the hospital. They may have had uh, tests that were ordered but have not yet had the results completed. And so there's a lot of opportunities for things to get dropped. And what this transitions of care measure aims to do is to bring clear connections between those sites of care, especially for at-risk older populations. So this is really focused on um, uh, patients who are in you know, Medicare who have been discharged from the hospital looking for four specific things. So there's notification of inpatient admission because if I'm the primary care doctor and I'm not a hospitalist. You would have no idea that, right. that the patient has been uh, admitted. Exactly. And so we think that's really an important first step. Um, next step that you would see in the primary care record should be the, the discharge information. So many hospitals do this routinely uh, at discharge that includes the discharge diagnosis, medications on discharge, tests that were ordered. There's a lot of standard things that are in there and we just want to make sure that that gets back to the right place, which is the site of ongoing care for that patient. They're not going to spend the whole year in the hospital, thank no. goodness. Um, 
And then uh, there's two other pieces. One is familiar to folks who have been using PETIS measures before, and that's medication reconciliation, because this is a measure that has been used in our HEDIS data set previously, which says if someone's discharged from the hospital within uh, 30 days of discharge, someone at their care team, whether it's a pharmacist who's working with them, or maybe a nurse or, the, or a doctor, has to do a reconciliation of the medications that the patient is now taking, uh, comparing it to what they had, were taking before and making sure that it makes sense. Hmm. Um, and then the fourth piece is patient engagement after inpatient discharge. And this is a way to look for someone who has been able to close the loop. So after the patient has been discharged, did someone from the practice call them? Did they make an appointment to come? make an appointment for the patient to come in and be followed up. So that's really to say, you know, you have to close the loop on the patient, um, what the patient is going to think about for going forward. I was in the hospital. They were throwing things at me 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden, I'm at home. I'm in charge of my care. Mm -hmm. And how can, you know, how can my primary care team be a support to me in that ongoing care? Look, uh, I... I know I worked in hospitals in the past. This is a real issue uh, across the country in sort of communicating and making sure those loops or the circle, as you called it, are closed. This is we're addressing a real issue across the country when we talk about this measure. Absolutely, and you know, as I said before, we're concerned about the potential for error that can happen when communication gets dropped. Let's talk about how the data is collected. What, how do we collect all of this data? Yeah, so this, um, this measure is being uh, used only in the Medicare product line. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned before the medication reconciliation measure, mm -hmm. which is something that's been of um, long standing in Medicare SNP plans and then more recently um, expanded to the whole Medicare population. Um, and the idea is that um, this is really done by reviewing charts. And the whole measure with these four indicators was built on an idea that all of these pieces of information should be found in the same chart that you find for where you find the medication reconciliation. So the idea is that there's not an additional pull of charts that has to be done to do this measure. It is more probably more time per chart, but that it should be able to be um, built securely on the basis of an existing measure. So so when you, this was designed, you had this in mind that we hope all this information is in the exact same place so it's not pulling additional chart or additional information from exactly. another source. Exactly. Okay, so we are uh, thinking about that. Uh, let's move on uh, to, the, to the next one. Mm -hmm. If we can, follow up after emergency department visit for people with high risk, multiple chronic conditions. I want you to know, Doc, if I'm not uh, looking at you, I'm listening. I'm checking for questions oh, no, no. online in worry. the chat box. So, so don't, <laughs> wor don't worry about that. Um, tell us about this one. Yeah, so this is in the same vein as the transitions of care. This is follow up after an emergency department visit for patients who have high risk chronic conditions. So we know that um, there's a subset of patients who are in Medicare, who are over 65, who have multiple chronic conditions. They are vulnerable. They may be frail. They often have functional limitations. And when they go to the emergency department, there may be changes that are made in their care or their medication that need to be followed up. There also could be um, a multifactorial set of events that led to them going to the emergency department. And emergency departments are excellent at taking care of that first thing that comes out of your mouth. You know, I have a rash, right. my arm hurts. Ouch. They, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> That's what they do. But they are not necessarily trained or thinking about or uh, really staffed up to do the kind of in-depth communication that a primary care team should be doing. Why was it that you came into the emergency room? Was it because you were, uh, you know, 
um, at risk for being evicted from your house, and that's why you were worrying about this pain because you thought you might have to go sleep on your neighbor's couch. You know, mm -hmm. what what were the what were the situations that led to you being in the emergency department? And so what we're looking for here is follow-up after an emergency department visit for this special population of frail folks with multiple high-risk conditions um, to see that they had a follow-up service within seven days of that emergency department visit. Mm -hmm. So that could be a phone call. It could be an in-person visit. We're just looking for there to be evidence that the ongoing care team took note of that emergency department visit and is trying to circle the patient back into ambulatory care. So who, who reports this then? Would it come from the emergency room or come from the primary? No, this is really focused on the Medicare plan. The oh, health okay, the plan, plan is reporting on it and it's the primary care team that is responsible for the follow-up. Oh, okay. So, I think that's what I meant. But Yeah, so it would almost certainly be um, it's a claims-based measure, so it's administrative only. It's not asking for chart data. Mm -hmm. um, and it's looking for the evidence of this kind of follow-up with the, with the primary care team. And we've seen a real issue where people have gone to emergency rooms and then sort of fallen off the planet, so to speak. Well, I think that the, the important piece um, for these patients with the high-risk chronic conditions, mm -hmm. there is almost always um, the treatment for one has some implications for the treatment for the others. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a medication that sort of conflicts with one of the other things that you've got, or there's a treatment, um, you know, some requirement of the treatment of one is going to influence your care in the other cases, you know, a, a sort of key um, example of this is a patient with um, diabetes plus four other things. Mm -hmm. And because of one of their other conditions, they're asked to fast overnight for a test the next morning. Well, if they're they diabetic and they're taking insulin, right. then that would be extremely harmful. And so that's an example of how um, important it is for there to be close follow-up of these patients who have multiple chronic conditions. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this one is, uh, I know, attracted some in public uh, comment, attracted some attention, and um, and it is a concern nationwide, and it has to do with opioids and the use of opioids at high dosage. There are really two here, and the use of opioids from multiple providers. Now, I wrote a blog and posted last week in preview to this, and um, and sort of stated that this is a problem where the whole healthcare system has to do its part because it's overwhelming. Um, we all see it in the news every day. I think this morning I saw a story about a young boy in Florida, a swimming pool, who touched accidentally opio an opioid and it killed him. So this is a pro, it was at the pool. It, it's a problem all over the country and this is our little part of trying to tackle this issue. That's right. So the use of opioids at high dosage and the use of opioids for multiple providers measures, which are being introduced for the first time into HEDIS this year, are focused on making sure that in the legitimate healthcare system, mm -hmm. that health plans are playing a role in making sure that conditions are being met where, you know, if I'm writing a prescription for a patient that I'm uh, responsible for what that might do to the patient and for the risk that the, that puts the patient under. We know that at high doses, patients are at risk of overdose and death. And so when we look at this question of, you know, patients who have been on an opioid for more than 15 days um, at a dose of more than 120 uh, equivalents of morphine, mm -hmm. milligram equivalents of morphine, you know, that's something that the health plan should be tracking. Mm -hmm. That's something that oversight, and many states have actually begun to do things like this using uh, prescription drug monitoring programs, mm -hmm. but not every state does it, and many states don't communicate with neighboring states. So we think that health plans actually can play an important role in being partners in this effort to, to do oversight on clinicians who are prescribing opioid medications and make sure that there is a um, 
thoughtful process towards managing those patients. And when we talk managing, getting the opioids in the right hands at the right dosage for the right amount of time. That's the that's, ultimate goal, correct? That's exactly right. Okay. And, you know, for some patients that means coming, um, going through a process of decreasing their use of opioids. Some patients, of course, might come into your practice already having been on opioids that someone else started them on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we know that that's a concern for some clinicians that they are, um, you know, that they're going to be held accountable for something they didn't do, they didn't start. Mm -hmm. But I think that, again, having the, having the health plan partner with the clinical teams in saying what are the resources that we need to help a patient uh, titrate down off of their opioids? You know, what are the resources that the health plan can offer and provide in terms of assistance, in terms of counseling, in terms of other alternative pain control measures. You know, we know that there's a lot of variability from person to person about what works mm -hmm. for pain control. You know, some people find acupuncture helpful, some people find, uh, you know, exercise helpful. And, you know, so it's really, there's a lot of uh, individual counseling that has to happen. And that is, the plan has an important role to play in supporting clinicians in being able to help taper some patients who are have been on these high doses for a long time and see if they can be controlled on a lower dose that would be safer for them, less of a risk of overdose, less of a risk of accidental death. Let's talk about how this is this information is collected. It's uh, the data source is administrative only, which means that's right. So the health plan has data about claims. So if someone's filled a prescription, they get a claim for it. And so the next measure I think is important to talk about in terms of the prescriptions because this is really um, another interesting safety issue. We know that when patients go to multiple pharmacies, right. there is an increased risk for error and for one to do something and another not to know it and potentially for there to be a diversion in the marketplace, patients trying to gather up more opioids than they need and then selling them, mm -hmm. you know, we're- Can, can we advance the slide, uh, please? Like, we're talking about use of opioids, opioids from multiple providers. And, uh, yes, that's right. So this measure, like the other one, is uh, being used in all three product lines, commercial Medicare and Medicaid, it's an administrative me measure, so the health plan uses data from claims to ascertain whether the patient got a prescription for an opioid from more than uh, three, more than um, more than three providers, so four or more prescribers, mm -hmm. and then also if they filled their prescription at four or more different pharmacies. Now you might say, "Gosh, why would I ever, you know, have four different people?" Uh, prescribing a medication, and then, you know, well, uh, certainly if you are on a long-term lipid-lowering agent, you know, you might have a few different doctors, your cardiologist, your internist, you know, who all would be happy to refill that for you. Right. Opioids are a little bit different. Um, most responsible prescribers today are looking to engage in agreements with patients that say, you know, I will prescribe this for you, but I'm the only one you can get it from. You're not going to go to anyone, someone else, and get another and get prescriptions for it. You only get prescriptions. A from pledge me. of sorts. Sort of a pledge. Yeah. A, 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 a plan that the patient and the clinician can agree on. Right. So that they can move forward. Mm -hmm. And so that is really, you know, when we see that there's a lot of this multiple prescriber or multiple pharmacy behavior going on, that suggests that the plan as a whole is not exercising good control, or maybe it's not providing adequate resources to its clinicians to engage with patients in that way. And so we want to encourage them We want to, to encourage do that. them to do that. Um, and again, the collection of this, this information, the data through source? Claims. Through claims. Through claims, okay. All right, we're going to move on to uh, depression screening and follow-up for adolescents and adults. The intent of this? Yeah, so this is a measure that is the third in our suite of depression care measures that uses um, electronic data sources. So it's an optional measure, mm -hmm. um, like the other two depression measures. And this is looking for patients 12 and older who are seen in their primary care team or who are, uh, even if they're not seen, if they've been screened for clinical depression. 
using a standardized tool. And for those who screen positive, that they received an appropriate follow-up, which is to say a, a referral um, or medication or some kind of follow-up care within 30 days. The, you, you talked about this being um, optional, and but this is all three of these measures are the beginning of something, right? Tell me about that. That's right. So the depression care suite um, is the other two depression measures are looking at uh, patients who have depression being monitored. They're having their symptoms monitored using the PHQ-9, which mm -hmm. is a patient reported outcome. Mm -hmm. So the measure is really built on clinicians gathering that patient reported data. There's no blood test I can take that'll tell me whether your depression's getting better or not. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's gotta come Only from I you. Only I can tell you, Only right. Only you can tell me. Right. And so the, the first measure looks to see did the patients with depression get a PHQ-9 done at regular intervals? And the second measure is to say, all right, for people who had a high burden of symptoms at the beginning of the year, how many had remission or got significantly better by six months later? And that's an outcome that we think, you know, we know patients want it. Patients want to get better. Mm -hmm. Clinicians who treat patients with depression also want that outcome. They want to see their patients improving. So these measures are really um, focused on helping the clinical care team do what they want to do. Uh, and the electronic clinical data source means, well, if there's not a claim where we're going to find a PHQ-9 score. So we know that this is something that has to be where you have to marry claims data with clinically detailed data. Mm -hmm. And we are agnostic about where that data comes from. It might come from an EHR or electronic health record. It might come from a case management system. It could come from a health information exchange. Uh, so there's, there's a number of places where that electronic data could live. Our goal here with these electronic clinical data system measures, which is a separate domain in HEDIS, is to say, you know, for places where the care team is going to be uh, better able to manage their patients by tracking the patient's outcome and getting patient reported outcome data, or where there's going to be data that might live in both the electronic health record or it could live somewhere else, like in a case management system, we think that the health plan building bridges with their care systems to get that electronic data is going to rapidly accelerate improvements in care at the delivery system level. Well, I'm kind of at a crossroads here because I don't know what to do because I have questions coming out of my ears in, but I think <laughs> there are a lot of them and they're about things we've already talked about. So we're gonna, we're gonna come back to those uh, and, uh, and we'll get to your questions in a moment. For you and I, I think we might push a little faster because we're already we'll at time, skip on. right? But no, <laughs> we, we don't need to skip, but let's, let's quickly move on to unhealthy alcohol use screening and follow-up. So alcohol use screening and follow-up is a recommendation from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that says primary care clinicians should screen their patients for alcohol use mm -hmm. because counseling is effective at helping people avoid the kind of problems and uh, misadventures that can follow uh, unhealthy alcohol use. Um, this is also an optional measure, so it's uh, using the electronic clinical data sources that I mentioned before, right. and it's looking for patients 18 years of age and older who have been screened for unhealthy alcohol use using a standardized tool like the CAGE questions or other standards questions like that. Um, and then if the folks have screened positive, did they get counseling or other appropriate treatment set up? Okay, and collected again. By just ECMS. Electronic clinical right. data source. So it's a, again, it's an optional measure this year. Okay. Uh, pneumococcal vaccination coverage for older adults. So this is a terrific example of a measure that used to be a survey measure, and it still is. So the survey measure is not going away yet. Um, but the question about whether you got the pneumococcal vaccine used to be simple. Did you get one shot? Well, now the CDC has updated their guidance about this, and there's two shots that you should be getting when you're older than 65. And the, uh, the idea with this electronic clinical data system measure is that a health plan will probably have data either from claims or from a state immunization registry um, or from other sources about 
of patients uh, getting those two vaccines. And so that's what this is really aimed at is, can we make a measure that finds the patients who are 65 and older who got both the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine? Because everybody, you know, might not happen on the day they turn 65, but, you know, should, within a certain number of months after, they should have gotten both vaccines. A couple of revisions to measures, uh, immuniz immunizations for adolescents. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, the CDC does uh, convenes the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and they updated their HPV vaccination recommendation to say, instead of three doses, you only need two. two. Right. So we've updated the measure to accept that as uh, numerator compliant. And on breast cancer screening? Breast cancer screening measure looks at um, screening for patients, uh, for women of a certain age group. And we look at that screening test. Typically, it's mammography. What we found out that is that um, breast tomosynthesis mm -hmm. uh, has been really accelerating uh, in use out there. Many communities say that they don't actually have the old style mammography machines anymore. They only have these digital TOMO machines. And um, when we reviewed the evidence and the guidance from various advisory um, uh, organizations, we felt that the best thing to do was to add this new technology as a method for meeting the numerator criteria for breast cancer screening. Great. Uh, in, uh, initiation of engagement of alcohol and other drug abuse or uh, dependence treatment and identify, uh, identification of alcohol and other drug services. So for these two measures, we basically added medication-assisted therapy, um, medication-assisted medication treatment as an option for treatment of alcohol or drug abuse, um, especially with the uh, you know, ongoing problems with opioid overuse in this country, the fact that people are using medication as a way to help people face that addiction, we wanted to make sure that those medications were included in the measure. We're also looking to stratify the measure by alcohol abuse, opioid abuse, and other drug abuse uh, in order to get better information for plans in terms of how to focus their efforts. Okay, so uh, we can advance one more slide beyond, there we go. Uh, Plan all cause readmissions. So this measure has been revised by adding the Medicaid product line to the measure. It has been around for commercial and Medicare for a while, uh, but it did not have a specific risk adjustment for Medicaid, and so we have added that, and we're looking forward to having data on Medicaid health plans going forward. And we'll move to the cross-cutting uh, changes. Explain what cross-cutting changes are. So, uh, I don't really <laughs> understand that terminology. So we, we realize when looking at one measure at a time, when we would reevaluate a measure, that um, sometimes there were bigger issues that came up that were hard to, we didn't want to just solve it for one measure. So an example is the first one I'm going to talk about, telehealth. Okay. So we knew that um, there are great advances in the delivery system, in the use of telephonic medicine, both uh, video and telephone conferencing, both for clinicians getting expert help from other clinicians, and also for patients seeking help from clinicians. Um, and when we started looking at it, we started with the behavioral health measures, where we knew that there were many parts of the country where there was poor access to behavioral health specialists, and that they were especially turning to telehealth to help them meet the needs of their patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we looked at the evidence for each of these um, uh, behavioral health measures that are listed here on the slide. We looked to see where there was good data that would suggest that telehealth would provide adequate care and effective care. And we updated the specifications for each of these measures to include either in the in some part of the measure, most, mostly in the numerators, but also some cases in the denominators or in exclusions, other parts of the measure as well. The ISNP exclusion. Yes, so when we started this work, we were looking at it from a point of view of special needs plans, which are health plans in the Medicare world that focus on really severely ill patients. Um, and we've since broadened it, so this should really be named uh, something broader than the ISNF exclusion. Um, 
we were looking to see where are there measures for which the 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 application of a measure to a frail population would have more untoward results than good ones. That there were patients who we would not be doing any favors by subjecting them to whatever the intervention was. So colorectal cancer screening is a good example. And um, you know, we just we knew that there was uh, patients who we didn't intend to really be in the measure. And so what this measure does is to exclude Medicare members age 65 and older who either are enrolled in an institutional special needs plan, which means they are institutionalized or eligible to be institutionalized, like in a nursing home setting, um, or are living long term in institutional settings from these four selected HEDIS measures for starting in HEDIS 2018. And so we've got colorectal cancer screening, breast cancer screening, osteoporosis management in women who had a fracture, and concoct controlling high blood pressure. And then updating the ECDS guidelines. So this is advancing and we're trying to advance with it, right? That's right. So, you know, <laughs> for these optional ECDS measures, we wanted to make sure that we had in place both guidelines as well as an audit option because we think that the future is we want to move in this direction. Um, but for, for this year, we would say, you know, if you're interested, go look at the guidelines and look at the measures, they're optional for reporting this year, but we would certainly encourage health plans to give it a try. Okay, so that uh, that sort of wraps up uh, the quick quick synopsis, and I, I want to let the doctor get her breath a little bit, because <laughs> <laughs> that was good. But, but I do want you to answer this, and for all of this, and, and we've tried to express it in our communications about this, we're not operating in a vacuum in CQA, we're listening to folks about each of these and we're responding to sort of the clinical updates that come up. Explain uh, our, our approach to new measures. That's right, so when there are areas in which we have really no measures, like opioid overuse, and we see what a national calamity is occurring, when we looked at this issue, we said, you know, is there a role for health plans to play in combating this epidemic? And we decided that there was. So, you know, that's an example of really a new area that didn't exist 10 years ago in terms of a focus. Um, the transitions of care measures are also new in terms of um, the healthcare system is not more fragmented today than it was 12 years ago, but we are increasingly aware of how fragmented it is. And the consequences of that fragmentation are, you know, unacceptably dangerous. And so when, we, when we've when we started on these measures, we were working closely with um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, uh, in terms of, you know, helping us to focus these these measures that would look on, you know, the transitions between healthcare settings, whether it's discharge from the emergency room or discharge from the hospital. Mm. Um, you know, in the whole scope of things we're doing, I also want to mention that we're working on a pilot to do rapid retirement of measures because we can appreciate that it does not feel like a, uh, you know, we're not putting plans in a good position if we only ever add measures. And we want to retire measures. And we have in the past retired measures when um, when guidelines would change and clinical guidelines say, you know, something is no longer indicated. But we're increasingly looking to uh, the whole measure set to see where are there measures that um, overlap a lot with other measures. You know, they don't provide um, information that's useful to compare plans to each other. And in that case, we think that there's a case for measures to be retired. And so we're looking in this pilot year to figure out what's the right process, what are the right steps we need to use to retire a measure quickly, and we're looking to have results of that pilot uh, this December. So on that note, that was the perfect segue, thank you, uh, for Lisa Slattery, uh, our uh, Vice President of Accreditation and Recognition Operations, who is relatively new at NCQA, um, so am I for that matter, but you're newer. <laughs> Um, and and comes from a plan background, so is is aware of sort of the administrative challenges that come with the HEDIS changes every year and the 
uh, accreditation standards updates every year, and they, we know that folks are watching this. So I imagine you're pleased to hear, I imagine you knew already about this pilot program to retire measures. Explain, um, give us a, your perception of where the plans stand on this coming from that, that sector. Well, I mean, my, my gut check is that people are seeing seven new measures and going, oh my gosh, there's seven new measures and there's changes, uh, lots of changes. And I am very familiar with the administrative burden that comes with implementing those changes, especially as um, more and more HEDIS measures are being used in value-based purchasing arrangements. But I hope that people can hear um, you know, all of these new measures are really predicated on real issues that are happening within our communities and within our populations, within our plans. And it is really important that we don't just focus on reducing measures at the expense of really driving quality care. And so I, I, I think this set of measures is critically important. I think Mary and her team have done a, a really great job of listening to how important it is to stay on an administrative track and not bring in additional chart chases. There is one measure here, but it's transition of care, and that is something that every plan is focused on because it's been shown to have significantly, uh, to significantly impact readmissions and admissions and uh, just ends in better care. And so I think it's really important that everybody understands, to, to your point, we really are listening. I, I don't think a day goes by that I don't have a conversation with our health plan partners. I think that's probably the case with Mary and Raina as well. We are in really close communication with our customers and we do understand. There's a lot of pressures. Uh, there's a lot of various forces on health plans right now and um, we truly are listening and we do have a plan. We do have a roadmap while it may not feel like right away, you know, we told you this and you didn't respond, right. we will get there. And this, and, and that's what I wanted to talk about when we discussed this uh, the other day and preparing for this, you, you sort of explained it that this is a little bit of bitter medicine, but to get to a better place. Explain that again. Well, I think that um, we know that there's some things that we at NCQA need to do. Some of the most consistent uh, concerns we have are around the financial burden of the chart chases and what it's doing in the provider offices. They're becoming very frustrated. Uh, they're already, in a, in a lot of instances, having to pull a lot of charts for Medicare Advantage, for not only the STARS program, but uh, risk adjustment. There's multiple other reasons that you would need charts. And so by the time HEDA season rolls around, there's a lot of pushback. And so we know, uh, and we hear consistently, we've got to do something about that. And there is a whole roadmap on, um, on data, on how to take this non-standard data and get it into standardized format, take away that primary source verification audit process, and really simplify this so that we can not only ease the burden on the plan of getting their HEDIS data, but also begin to be much more proactive in driving care at the point of care and getting that data back into the hands of the provider in a meaningful way. So there's a tremendous effort around that. And we actually have a um, e-measure certification right. for vendors now uh, that plans may be interested in because it, it would allow, if you can, uh, get your providers to pull the data in through a certified vendor, it would allow it to be considered standard clinical data. And so that would allow for that, uh, not having to do that primary source verification, which can be uh, a challenge. That, that, that uh, takes away a step, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so, so I think we, uh, what we tried to do in communicating this, and you all, of course, are, are subject matter experts who who understand it much more than I do, and especially in your, in your prior roles, is, is we're trying to explain this leads to um, to better data collected in an easier and more cost-effective manner. But right. it's kind of a long trip to get there. 
Is and that it, sort of accurate? It, it can be a, a challenge, and, and plans are aware of this because providers are at all different stages of readiness to share their clinical data. So they, they're, they're very familiar with the challenges, and so um, we run into uh, the same challenge of various uh, readiness across all of our health plan partners. And so if there's, there's various stages across um, the entire industry, and so we're re really working hard with a lot of key players in the data exchange industry to, to try and move this forward. Doc, one of the questions that we, we got uh, was about the, the ED um, and the primary care follow-up between mm -hmm. the emergency departments and, and primary care physicians. Who's responsible for collecting that information? And I think I asked you this earlier, but it's at the primary care physician that shares it, it comes from claims data. It's the health plan. It's the health plan. That is being measured in this case because they have the claims for the care that's provided. And so, but somebody is going, to, who, who is going to, I guess it comes in the claims data automatically, they see it, or, or uh, in the follow-up data? I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Um, no, that's okay. So when someone's discharged from the emergency department, right. The health plan knows that because they get the claim for the emergency department visit. And then they look in the claims for the period after that to see if the patient had a contact with a, the, the clinician that's providing ongoing care. Mm -hmm. So any contact within the seven day period would right. count as follow up. Right. Because we presume they would would talk about it. We, yes, we would certainly <laughs> hope and expect that they would. Right. We would, uh, we would expect the patient to tell their primary care uh, physician. I'm looking at some of these uh, uh, questions. How long does it take for the PCP to be notified after the ER? Well, we're saying seven days, right, is what we're Yes. What so we're promoting, the, we have um, to pull out the slides, but I'm I think it's... looking to make sure I don't uh, confuse any of these. Um, yes, so within seven days of the emergency department visit, we want to see that there's follow-up. Now, it's conceivable that there might be plans that find that they are, could improve the rates of the clinicians by notifying the clinicians mm -hmm. that the patient was seen in the emergency department. If that happens, that, if that, if that, happens uh, that you know that information is not always. Um, it doesn't. Uh, many hospitals and emergency rooms are really good about getting the word back to the treating clinical team, the outpatient team. Mm -hmm. But we think that this is a, a way to encourage it to be even better. How do an, another question? Uh, and I can't. I read it now. I can't find it. But how do we define high dose of opioids? So, dosage. yeah, the high dosage of opioids measure is based on, um, there's something called a, a morphine equivalence dose, MED, mm -hmm. and all opioids have, um, a can be mapped to that morphine equivalence. So whether it's Oxycontin or Percocet or whatever the narcotic is, um, the idea is if you're on a dose that's higher than... I messed up all, I mixed yeah, up all your slides. Right. Right. <laughs> no worries. I think it's higher than uh, 200 morphine equivalents, milligrams. Yeah. Okay. Uh, equivalent with morphine. Um, no, I'm sorry. It's 120. Yes. Okay. So 120 milligram, milligram morphine equivalent. Um, let's, uh, uh, Tina Brownfield asked, will the PHQ-2 satisfy the new depression measure? Yes. So the screening, as a standardized screening tool, the PHQ-2, which is a very brief form of the PHQ-9, um, uh, would absolutely meet those criteria. Now, folks, we're running out of time, so here's, here's what I want to tell you. We're going to take all of these questions and try and get them some quick answers and we'll post them uh, in the details section. This, after we're done here, this will be posted on our YouTube channel. So, And we'll also, I always take a chance to promote our blog, blog.ncqa.org. 
we'll answer some of them there so you can look for them there because we are quickly running out of time. And I want to make sure that we make time for Raina Agandeco and uh, our standards preview because that's sort of an extra treat to all of this because, you know, for, for insurance folks, I guess this is a treat, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> in, because none of it uh, is formally released for another couple of weeks. Um, but if we can advance our slide, then uh, Raina can begin to uh, share some of the things um, that we expect to see. And, and the thing that you say is that the future of evaluating quality is integration. Tell it me about is, that. It is. So um, first of all, I want to say that we're really excited about these changes this year. Um, population health management, strangely enough, is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I actually started in health plans, too. Started off in a quality improvement department doing disease management programs. And for folks who've been in the field for a while, you know that when managed care organizations were doing um, these types of interventions, we started off doing single chronic condition programs like diabetes and cardiovascular illness. Um, we found over the last few years, of course, that that has evolved, that the single disease approach state um, didn't really show efficacy, uh, and it's evolved beyond that to a whole person approach, so that if you're treating an individual who has diabetes, you also want to be concerned with their other health care needs, if they're a smoker, if they need to lose weight, other things that are going on with their illness. Um, and so in this set of standards, we really wanted to reflect that change. We had standards in here that were still promoting the adoption of single disease focused programs. Um, and so we know we need to move, we know we needed to move beyond that and we've done that in this set of standards. The other thing that we really wanted to promote was the shift in accountability. Uh, health plans were traditionally the ones that built the gap, you know, pr providers before PCMAs became really popular. Um, we're really focused on acute care needs. When you came to the office, they saw you for what you were, what you needed, what you complained about when you came through the door. And health plans filled the gap um, in really focusing on sort of that long-term population health, looking at the needs of groups of in, groups of patients. Now we see that shift moving to the provider setting, moving to patients in medical homes, moving to accountable care organizations. This set of standards really recognizes that, and so we're really excited about. Um, bringing that to our health benefit accreditation standards in 2018. It's a set of uh, requirements that we have been looking forward to putting in for a number of years, and we have the opportunity to do that now. Great, and uh, let's move right on to the sort of the, the chunks of changes that you, you yes. put out for us, and that would be population health mm -hmm. management. This is a whole series of, mm -hmm. uh, of additions. This correct? is actually, yes, so this is a new section that we're introducing in 2018. Um, for folks who are used to meeting our health plan standards, when they hear we're introducing new standards, there's a tendency to get nervous. So um, just don't get nervous um, <laughs> because many of the standards that are in there are standards that have been in there for a while. So case management, for example, and wellness and health promotion standards have been in um, health plan accreditation for a number of years. They were in our QI, our quality improvement section. Those we've maintained in population health management because we know they're important aspects of care. What we've done um, is to make it more flexible for health plans to plan their strategies around what they want to do for their particular patients. So instead of having standards in here that require a health plan to have you know, one or two disease management programs, we're saying to the plans now, share with us your strategy. Who are you going to intervene with? How are you going to intervene with them? What goals are you setting for them? Um, show us that you're intervening across the spectrum from patients or, excuse me, members who are healthy to those with emerging risk to those who are um, who have really serious um, illnesses that need to, that need attention. Uh, so we really want to open it up for the health plans to define what their strategies are, and to tell us what they are, and to tell us how they're intervening with these populations. Hmm. Population identification. Population that? identification. So. Um, that's in the PHM strategy. Population health identification is a part of that. That's where they identify who they're intervening with. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because part of that is segmenting the population into um, risk groups. You know, who are the folks that you need to intervene with and identifying what their needs are. Um, so those are, you know, those are the, the two new areas, uh, PHM1 strategy and PHM2 population identification. Um, I mentioned before that PHM4 and PHM5 are things that have been, that were in the standards already. Um, another new area that we have is uh, PHM3, delivery system supports. 
So for a number of years, we've heard from plans that as the shift in accountability has occurred to patients from medical homes or to ACOs, there was a desire for them um, to be able to reflect their work with their practitioners in this area. And so in this new section, we're giving the opportunity for plans to tell us how they're working with practitioners in their networks um, to deliver populational management services. So things like data sharing or um, things like helping your primary care providers transition into medical homes are things that plans can now get credit for under the section. Okay, let's move on to, you have another slide for for other changes coming and uh, and some yeah. folks will be happy to see that word on the So line. yeah, so there is a, a wonderful <laughs> word on the screen um, called retirement. So uh, <laughs> so we're happy when we can remove standards as well uh -huh. uh, because there are sometimes, as Mary mentioned, the evidence shows that something is not working. And so we uh, really pride ourselves on making sure that the standards that we have in here are evidence-based and that they're consensus driven. So experts are agreeing that these are important areas of evaluation. Uh, and so the, the standards that we retire uh, go through a rigorous evaluation to say, are these still valuable given where we are in the market today? And so we're happy to remove um, a number of standards that we don't see um, valuable anymore. Um, uh, so one of them is appropriate classification of denial, so UM4H. Uh, this was a new standard that was introduced a couple of years ago, um, aimed around uh, evaluating whether or not plans were appropriately classifying denials. Uh, we found after looking at this and looking at the results for a couple of years that it really wasn't doing what it was intended to do, so we wanted to remove um, it from the set. We are uh, now looking at alternative ways to really get at the issue, um, and, and we're not going to do it through this standard anymore. We're going to be looking in the future to see how we can address it. The other three standards that we're removing, disease management, which was QI6, and practice guidelines, QI7, and support for healthy living, all became redundant um, once we introduced the new PHM set of standards. So we are, we're removing those um, those requirements. No point in duplicating work. No point in duplicating work. Right. Mm -hmm. And then updated the expanding track of out-of-network yes. requests for services. Yes. And this was a standard that we had in place for marketplace for the marketplace product line, where we're requiring plans to track out-of-network um, requ requests for out-of-network providers um, and services. And um, this year, actually, when 2018, it's going to actually be required for all the product lines. So um, not only tracking the requests for out-of-network services and, and providers, um, we're going to be looking at it in commercial, Medicare, Medicaid, and the marketplace in 2018. Thank you very much, uh, Raina, for uh, coming along and uh, giving us that little preview. Now I'm putting you on the spot. Mm -hmm. What is the date that the standards actually come out? So the standards are scheduled for release on July 24th, so in a couple of weeks they will be out. Well, actually a week, really, right? It's okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rain is a new mother. <laughs> and, and I it's didn't know. I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, uh, I, I want to come back to you just briefly uh, before we close out and we tell folks about some education opportunities we have for them. Uh, one of the questions was interesting to me, and it was about the um, uh, the pharmacies and clinicians. And it, and the question was for the or, uh, and it's from uh, Mary Jane, and I'm not going to say your last name because I'll butcher it. Mary Jane, on the opioid measure, are the four or more practitioners, four or more pharmacies, or four or more practitioners and pharmacies? I guess they're asking That's are those exclusive question. or do they all count in the same? The, same bunch. The um, and if you don't know, it's okay. We can answer online if you don't know well, for sure. I just somehow filed that one piece of paper somewhere <laughs> in the middle of this. Process. I probably took it from you. It's possible. So the idea is that those are neither of those events is a good event. Um, so if you have uh, four or more prescribers, like clinicians writing a prescription, that's a problem. Um, if you have four or more pharmacies filling prescriptions, that's a problem. So we actually have three rates here, the multiple prescribers, multiple pharmacies, and then the combination, which is to say, did you have both? Mm -hmm. So I, I think they're, they're sort of asking, well, what does two or, and two, you know, two clinicians, two? No, no, it's four. Uh, four and four. Right. Okay. So, so they are sort of exclusive groups. They're, they are separate um, indicators, okay. multiple prescribers and multiple pharmacies, and then we have a third indicator that says, who of your patients met both of these? 
if we expect this to be a small number, mm -hmm. it's expressed as a rate per thousand members. So it's not a common occurrence, thankfully, but again, we think that it's worthy of being tracked. Okay. And again, we will be um, we will be taking many of these questions and putting them in the blog and answering them because I have 30 on my screen right now that, <laughs> that we didn't get to. Uh, and we still filled an hour. I do want to tell folks about these uh, education opportunities um, coming up about all of this. The HEDIS updates, there's uh, October 6th. Uh, there's an update session in New Orleans. That's my birthday. That'd be a good place to spend my birthday. <laughs> uh, October 24th in Denver. And then the in introduction to health plan accreditation is October 2nd through 4th in New Orleans as well. And advanced health plan accreditation is October 5th in New Orleans and October 23rd in Denver. Uh, you can uh, get more information on our website, ncqa.org. And uh, if you just uh, look at the education tab or search education, you can find those events and find out how to sign up for those. I want to thank each of you for being here. It actually, our little experiment was kind of good, <laughs> didn't it? Uh, Dr. Mary Barton, Lisa Slattery, and Raina Akadeko, thank you very much. I also want to thank our communications and marketing staff for uh, putting this together. There are people behind the cameras working for us, and I want to make sure we thank them. You'll find a recording of this Hangout on you, our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and search NCQA. Uh, it'll be on there. Uh, again, we've got a lot of questions, so watch our blog, blog.ncqa.org, uh, where we expect to uh, sit the doctor down and ask her to answer a couple of uh, questions or some of her folks. Uh, to answer a couple of questions for you so we make sure that we, we cover um, your needs and you can always send questions to social media at ncqa.org we um, we uh, encourage you to uh, follow us or friend us on Facebook Twitter uh, and LinkedIn uh, those are the places you'll find us and find a lot of updates about what's going on here at ncqa again thank you each of you and thank you for watching I'm Matt Brock. We'll see you again, no doubt.